Hello and welcome to the Weekly Artifact. This is a tri-weekly podcast created by two friends who met in undergrad and, against all odds, decided to keep talking to each other. I'm your host, Alex, joined by my co-host, who, as of 2014, told me I was, quote, the only white person he ever knew that watched the boondocks. Hello, I'm Justin. The internet moves fast. The hot takes of today are less than a distant memory by tomorrow. We're here to slow down and recover the content that's been lost along the way in order to make sense of where the world was, where it is, and where it will be. To that end, we've each chosen an artifact from the web to discuss together. Our comments are our own and are not associated with any institution. The show may contain explicit language and themes, so see the show notes for specific content warnings. Justin, bud, what do you got today? My artifact today is a video... Um, called What's the Difference Between History and the Past? Um, it's from PBS Idea Channel, um, hosted by Mike Brugnetta. The, this video, um, like all Idea Channel, video, uh, all Idea Channel videos, uh, starts off with his thesis, which is that history doesn't exist until we create it. And so he basically is looking at um, he has like a, a his like an actual like history textbook, and then he has uh, like the box set of Downton Abbey, and he basically starts off asking, you know, what's really sort of the difference between these? What you know, what are the similarities? What are the differences? So he you know points out like they're both are you know technically accurate and based on extensive historical research. However, the uh, textbook, you know, is supposed to inform, whereas Downton Abbey is supposed to entertain primarily, and so that so those are some of the so that's kind of his his starting off point, and from there he develops into asking, or he, there, from there he develops into, you know, explaining how we tend to think of history as quote what actually happened, um, whereas we don't take historical fiction like Downton Abbey in the same way, and Downton Abbey is um, this, like, historical drama about um, Britain, basically. And so we don't necessarily take, we don't take Downton Abbey as fact, um, despite that, um, you know, it's based in this research. So basically, uh, he starts to talk about the differences between the past and history, um, and basically history, the past is uh, just a series of events um, but history is how we construct that into a narrative. Because um, if you just, there's no way you could really look at the past without just appearing as these sort of unconnected, spontaneous events. Um, so we have to have some sort of narrative in order to make sense of it. But narrative always means leaving things out because there's no way to capture um, every single perspective. Uh, on something, he uses the example of, like if you were going to write a biography on Elvis Presley, you know if you were going to try and ca- uh, capture you know every single person that interacted with Elvis and all the stuff like it would be thousands of pages long. Most of it would have nothing to do with Elvis, really. So you know, so you can mm-hmm. imagine how um, any historical event or person can't be sort of captured without narrativizing it and leaving stuff out. So another quote he had, he said. The past is gone. It doesn't exist except in our reconstructions of it. Um, so that's like thinking about the gaps and how we can try to fill them in in certain ways, but like ultimately um, you can't ever fully fill in the gaps. Um, one example, um, somewhat famous example, he talks about um, Homer um, at one point describes, uh, the ancient Greek poet Homer describes the sea as being wine dark. Um, which has led a lot of people to question, you know, did Greeks see color differently somehow, or did they just lack the language to describe the sea as what we might today refer to as blue, or what, did people at the time find that description to be strange? And, you know, it's an example of, like, a gap which we can't know because no one thought to sort of record the answer to it, or, you know, if they did, it's lost already. Uh, and then there's other things which are also in some ways gaps for other reasons, um, such as, you know, the very fact that we have to use language to um, explain things, um, always language itself becomes subjective. So you describe something as a riot or a rebellion, 
Um, do you describe an official as a leader or a despot? Um, you know, these decisions um, influence how people are going to understand the story that you're trying to tell. Basically, he says, you know, we might understand Downton Abbey in a couple ways. We might understand it either as um, something that's really just commenting on the present, but using the past to do so, or we might see it as sort of just showing how all you know history is basically art. And then he, in the end, he, um, he also he looks at this a documentary on O.J. Simpson and talks about you know basically his point there is that you know even though there's no way to really perfectly recapture it because even though there's no narrator in the documentary, the camera is still sort of like implying, you know, the way it frames stuff still implies how you should understand things. And, you know, he ends saying, you know, history and historical fiction are, quote, more alike than we tend to imagine. Mm -hmm. So that's the video. And basically I picked it because... Uh, I've actually had like a decent number of conversations generally um, either with uh, people who are a little more conservative or who for whatever reason have uh, taken up like a conservative talking point. And they seem to have this view that there's like this uh, objectivity and authority to the idea of history or the past, and which they kind of tend to use interchangeably in that sense. Like, I've had this conversation around, like, you know, uh, fem the history of, like, feminist movements, history of civil rights movements, where, you know, I'll get accused of, like, trying to change history, um, which I'll get more into that later. Uh, I do, the, But the one that was most recent, that was perhaps also, like, the most stark example was um, someone who <laughs> was, they wanted to basically make this argument, um, they were trying to weigh in on whether or not the Ten Commandment, like this court case about whether the Ten Commandment should be displayed in front of a, govern a government building. And they were basically saying that they should be allowed to be displayed because taking them down would be changing history. But I think that sort of like illustrates this way that this like a certain notion of what history is really is just kind of like reflecting like a world view more than anything so but but that was mm -hmm. sort of like my inspiration for for picking this but i'll let uh alex jump in uh they better not move those goddamn commandments <laughs> tell you that much for fucking free i mean i know i've seen i guess the first thing i think of is just sort of the crossroads of where we find ourselves now i always love talking about recent events to sort of really date how far away it took me to edit these things <laughs> but i mean just sort of people really sort of learning about like in en mass not everybody obviously or even i think maybe even either of us necessarily but like learning about like juneteenth and like the tulsa massacres and shit that happened like these huge like events important for different reasons but obviously still join together and just these happen these are things that had occurred this is the past but like because we're not told about it in school because it's not part of sort of the pop dialogue um you know it's not really it's not it wasn't my history i mean even though you know i was you know bet directly benefited or harmed from it for you know various reasons i mean mostly but benefited but um or probably exclusively because you know like privilege and all that but like just like these things happen but like i didn't know about it until you know a year or two ago or whatever the fuck so like it doesn't count like i don't why should i feel bad about that like what do i have to like what do i care yeah, you know, so it's just, like, a way of, I I think, I and even, I mean, I think he was leading there, but just, like, sort of the idea of how harmful it can be to sort of take advantage of, like, how how harmful, like, taking advantage of history can be. I think, I mean, obviously, everybody understands the phrase, you know, history is written by the victor or whatever, but, like, the sort of, like, the real implications of that. And I think the one thing I wanted to say is I was kind of hoping he would, just knowing sort of what his, the post politics are that like when the guy that like wrote the show i don't know if you caught this i'm sure you did but like, he was talking about like, yeah like you know i wanted to write a show about when everybody had a station in life and they all got along like just fine and i was like did they i don't think that that's what happened at all i think you want the baller to be happy about being a butler we need a little more pushback just like to say like hmm. i mean his point is that like i don't know maybe i didn't look into it but like, he's saying it so obviously that's what how the show's going to present itself i would have been like been like hmm. maybe there's more class politics involved in 1850 than like the author wants there to be <laughs> yeah i mean i think that was um sort of uh mike Renetta ended up 
talking about when he started to talk about um, the, the the show as a commentary on the present. And I should say too, um, if you go to the video, he 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 cites a lot of people, and, and some of this is coming from some of the people he cites as well. But um, when he starts talking about that, like it is that he's not so much interested in critiquing the author's um, statement there, although I'm sure he probably doesn't agree with it, but he's more mm-hmm. so interested in like the way that statement reflects again, like a certain, what, how the author like wants the world to be today, where it's like, you know, he, he's going to say like, Oh, back then everyone accepted their lot as a way of saying like today, that's what every like, that would it be cool if everyone did that today sort of. Cause he's, he does talk about like, you know, um, in like the context of the, the um, episode uh, or this video came out in, um, 2016 and so like thinking about uh it seems weird now it's like 2016 is like a tumultuous time mm-hmm. but i mean yeah it still was and so so thinking about like comparing that tumult to this like fantasy of like everyone just kind of accepting things and being okay with it um, i think was sort of where he was what his critique was basically yeah so i think um to go back to this sort of idea of what is what is and isn't changing history, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. I think it's 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 just interesting the way that even like that phrase like changing history is it's like reflects this sort of idea that like history is almost handed down from this ethereal being or something, and rather than just being written by you know a bunch of old racist white dudes. I, mm-hmm. I mean, there is now, you know, more recently, I mean, there's always been counter histories, but I think more recently they've become a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more numerous. Um, so I don't want to like erase the work people have done in the past to do counter histories, but, but I mean, for the most part, I think like, well, I'm sure you had the same experience being in elementary school and basically learning that, you know, Christopher Columbus landed somewhere in new england and you know it was just so nice to the they mm-hmm. that they like gave him a turkey and then so i just let the pilgrims take over because they were just such good people or whatever it's like you know that that is history it's not a very good history we can definitely <laughs> tell i mean we can tell it's a bad one <laughs> we can tell better histories i mean <laughs> but I, I mean i think that's like a point that i want to make too though is just that like i'm not saying that you know what my version of history is is like objectively correct or something like my point is that there is no like objective history and and that old racist history is in some sense, correct, and it, only from the viewpoint of like the racist person who was writing it back then. Mm-hmm. You know, to them, they were good people or whatever, and so that that is their story. But there's there's different stories we can tell, and there's better stories we can tell. And I think uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is like what like who benefits from telling what story, and you know, mm-hmm. if your goal is to sort of like undo some of these systems of uh you know white supremacy patriarchy etc you know you have to find those histories that are are going to do it and yeah the idea of this is like changing history it's like in one sense like yes it is changing history um but it's but we're supposed to sort of change history um Mm -hmm. you know where history is always you know subjective and we're supposed to find better ways and different ways to tell it in order to you know, reflect what we're like new ideas and, and what we're basically like what, what sort of goals we're trying to achieve as well mm-hmm. yeah and it's like it's a shame because like to use the word better like you're correct it's just like yeah history is better when you know that like george washington used like the teeth of his slaves and not wood but like it's really not better that that's what happened <laughs> you're just like ah man isn't it just nicer if just like ah it's just fucking a tree instead of in his mouth instead of just like horrible brutality getting like human rights problems like ah, just easier to not think about it you know mm-hmm. yeah and i think we do see that a lot too where uh like for example like if you're thinking about like 
uh, transgender people or whatever, people be like say like they didn't used to exist before or something. Mm-hmm. So it's just like mm-hmm. this sort of like fantasy idea of what it used to be like, where it's like we don't want to sort of think about a particular history and so we just sort of deny it the same way that we might want to deny that his teeth were made from his slaves. From some people's perspective, they didn't ever have to interact with the trans person, so that is the history that they mm-hmm. are recording. But at the same time, we know that trans people have always existed. If you look at, you know, again, different evidence from the past to create a different narrative of it, you, you'll see a different history. Uh, and to, it's, obje- I mean, it's, it is just, it's a better, more accurate history that also mm-hmm. accomplishes the goal of um, helping us make sense of the world today and um, basically make life better for you know, traditionally marginalized people. I had one other point I don't even know if it's worth making. What is it? Uh, I was just going to say, it always does, it, it has always like baffled me how, I don't know how people think history gets constructed. You know, like anything has to be filtered through at least one person's senses. So like it's already going to be subject to their biases. But, you know, in reality, right. we're probably filtered through many people's perspectives and biases yeah and that's even before we start thinking about like do we have to should we be thinking about like non-human like does it matter like how this impacted animals Mm -hmm. or the environment or anything like that so it's like i don't know like whenever people just say like history as if it's like this like concrete immovable thing i'm like i don't like why if you just think about it a little bit, I feel like that just kind of, like, falls apart, but... Yeah, I mean, just thinking about even just, like, one person telling you a story of what happened, like, two nights ago, you're like, yeah, but, like, mm-hmm. hmm, you're the one telling me that, so, like, mm-hmm. maybe. They're uh, consciously deciding, like, this is important, I'm gonna leave this out, this is unimportant, but they're also subconsciously, like, like well, he'll fill, he gets, like, he'll fill in these gaps, but, like, where it's, like, 200 years ago, like, you can't fill those same gaps in anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, which also is, I think, maybe just a critique of fucking textualism with fucking the Supreme Court. I think that could really <laughs> balloon this bitch out. <laughs> Even when you make assumptions about whether or not the other people are making assumptions, like, you're already, at, like, as soon as you're listening to it, you're adding another, like, layer, let alone having it told to you. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no, you can't really get away from that. You have, like, I mean, you would have to just have a fucking video recording. And, like, even, I mean, like, you can still just be like, yeah, well, like, I mean, even so, like, well, what gets focused on? Well, I mean, you just, like, a fucking CCTV static security camera, unless a cop shot somebody 17 times in the back for being a, I don't know, a Latino youth, and they're just like, well, all right, break all these cameras, I gotta need this for evidence, and then maybe cameras don't help anyways. But that's hypothetically. That was the point when he, when he was looking at the OJ documentary, right. it's like, what the camera frames, but even if it was, like, you know, just a static camera it's like okay but someone still put that camera up in a particular right. spot there's still things that are outside of the camera's view exactly exactly so to cap there's just no way to capture history mm-hmm. in like an objective sense all right alex that's all i have for my artifact this week what's your artifact so my artifact is a video from October 11th, 2018, by the YouTube channel Internet Historian, uh, titled The Story of Coney 2012, sort of detailing the story or the history of the sort of Coney 2012 movement and uh, Jason Russell, the sort of figurehead for uh, the Invisible Children, the organization, and sort of the movement itself. You know, Coney, broadly, Coney 2012 is was a movement by Jason Russell, as I said, in his quest to stop the Ugandan warlord. Uh, Joseph Kony was the head of the Lord Resistance, Lord's Resistance Army uh, in Uganda. And on March 5th of 2012, um, a video from the Invisible Children uh, dropped on YouTube uh, in an attempt to raise aware- you know, an awareness campaign to mobilize action to capture or kill Joseph Kony. And, quote, the goal of the story was to make Kony famous. Um, the video is approximately 30 minutes long. Then Russell said that he had hoped to get 500,000 views in the entire year of 2012, but they got that in the first three hours of the video dropping. Going back to sort of the um, genesis of the sort of Coney movement and Jason's involvement, uh, the video talked about, I took a 2003 trip to Uganda 
as an aspiring filmmaker with two of his friends looking for a story. And Jason tells a story about how a car uh, was shot in front of us by a rebel army who was led by a group led by a guy named Joseph Coney. And that story sort of stretched out is that earlier in the day, a car had been shot going down the same road. Um, though he sort of frames it a little more, t- the packs of time, sort of what the wording choice he used to make seem like he was there when it happened. But um, Jason and his group then drive to a city for s- the city to safety uh, and find that all the kids from sort of the outlying villages commute to the city to sleep at night to avoid being captured by the LRA. Um, and Jason would spend the next... 10 years trying to improve things in Uganda and stop Kony. So there's a lot of sort of swinging for the fences and failed attempts uh, before Kony 2012 was, became like the most viral uh, YouTube video sensation at the time. Um, within the video, they're selling a $30 action kit to do some, uh, to what they call Cover the Night, which is sort of social justice vandalizing uh, on April 20th of 2012. Um, and within days of the video dropping going viral, there's a compilation in the uh, internet historians video shown of news outlets uh, and reporters criticizing and challenging the truth and the simplicity of the video sort of oversimplifying accusing of oversimplifying the story and other charities were sort of getting upset that he was uh, taking the spotlight from the smaller group um, it got popular enough that you know the president of Uganda made a statement about how they don't need just a slick YouTube video to take notice uh, and sort of to promote the next month or so of for the cover of the night incident Jason would go on sort of this nonstop press tour going like from network to network, uh, interview to interview to um, support the program. Then that sort of eventually led to a, uh, you know, the probably not notorious for anybody that's familiar with the story, mental breakdown that Jason suffered, uh, stripping naked and sort of rambling incoherently in the streets. He was admitted to a um, mental health facility, uh, for two weeks until he was sort of until he had all his mental faculties about him again. That happened a couple of days before the event, um, and then the internet historian regards as slacktivism, but just sort of the registered numbers of attendees versus the actual uh, people that ended up sort of actually participating. Some of the figures in Toronto, fifty thousand people registered, but the real attendance was fifty. In Sydney, Australia, eighteen thousand people registered, but the real attendance was March of twelve. And in Montreal, the real attention, the registered attendance was 4,800, but there was no, there's a zero, it's like a not applicable number of people were participated in the events were effectively canceled in a lot of places. We were late teens, mid to late teens when this happened. I mean, do you remember sort of the progression, the history? Were you involved in any way? Did you buy an activism kit? <laughs> no, I did not buy an activism kit. Um, I feel like by the time I sort of heard about Coming 2012, it had already sort of uh, aspersions had already sort of been cast on it. There's no point where I sort of felt like impassioned to do something about it because, like I said, I think by the time I, I, I heard about it, like sort of in the context of it being kind of discredited, even though I will say it's not discredited is maybe too strong of a word. I think there was mm-hmm. problems with the campaign, but it wasn't like Honestly, the the first wave of sort of discrediting. So my impression of it was actually that, like even before I watched this video, I my impression of it was that a lot more of it was made up mm-hmm. than it was. Sure. So I mean, there's definitely some truth to it, even if the story was uh, way oversimplified and maybe even exaggerated in some ways. Right. But yeah, that was kind of my, I feel like I heard about it sort of in the context of that sort of wave of discrediting. Yeah, it was funny for me watching this video again, because I remember, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I kind of knew, like, one of the worst dudes in my high school, like, came up to me, he's like, you know, Cody's dead, right, dude? And I was like, what? I just, like, I just took it at face value. I was, like, very confused. I was like, I don't know, man, but maybe, (laughs) like, obviously, of course, he's the one that had that take, but it's fine. (laughs) Um, yeah i guess one of the things i wanted to talk about that we sort of mentioned before recording but like the reason that this sort of spoke to me in a modern sense like sort of contemporary i guess in a contemporary sense is that sort of the parallel that i'm sort of seeing between like people register to like attend an event or like sort of 
make some sort of social statement against the, you know, something that needs uh, to be changed or challenged. And then the uh, ultimately underwhelming numbers are sort of how quickly people sort of tire or forget or, you know, just sort of accept current standings, something that we see sort of whatever happened between the sort of, I don't know, black square Instagram accounts to like now, like, I mean, obviously in some places they're still like under pretty constant duress and protest, but it seems like as far as like social media activity and sort of personal engagement, definitely like the Black Lives Matter movement has dropped off significantly from your sort of standard, I don't know, suburbanite white Twitter user. You know, the term selectivist can definitely be used for better or worse, I think. I, I mean, I think there is definitely, like you were saying, a lot of credence to the idea that some people uh, only post online and that may... I mean, A, I think there's the problem that you just mentioned of when you're post, then, you know, are do you even stand by your post? I mean, that's literally, like, the least you can do where you definitely see people where they'll post... They'll be very impassioned about an issue one day, and then the next day they're not. They don't even care about it anymore. They're, they're saying some contradictory, but I, but I think maybe the other bigger issue that you do see is I think there are a lot of people who think you know oh well I joined this event because I saw someone uh, I saw like a, the Facebook event for it or whatever. So that must be all mm-hmm. that there is to organizing. Right. And I think people a lot of times don't appreciate how much work goes into organizing. And, you know, I'm, I myself, I'm not an organizer, but I know, so I just know, uh, you know, secondhand, I guess, or some of the work that goes into it. But, you know, you got to have real connections to people on the ground. You got to make sure that you have uh, people that are willing to drive, you know, other people to and from the event. Uh, mm-hmm. You might have to like coordinate with the local government there or something. Like, there, there's a lot of different things that can go into making uh, a, a a protest event successful. That's you know goes way beyond just setting up a Facebook event and just assuming that everyone who says that they're going to go will show up. But I also think that sometimes people are can be a little bit too hard on people who post and just sort of assume that anyone who's posting is by definition a selectivist. And I'm not even saying that, you know, if you post, you also have to be an organizer or something. I mean, I mean, I think you probably should be doing something. Um, you, if it's, if it's small, whether that's showing up to a protest, but I mean, I think you should be doing something like that. But at the same time, you know, there's some, some, for some people that's, you know, as much as we can really ask for, like, if you're working two jobs, whatever, and, you know, all you can feel like you could really contribute at the moment is is just lending your voice online. Like, I don't think we should necessarily automatically dismiss that either. I think there's sometimes a tendency to be like, well, posting right. doesn't matter at all. I, I think it still can be helpful to see that there's support you if it's just online and and hopefully one day that will materialize into something else yeah i'll just go into sort of some of the yeah sleuthing that i did on the channel then so i mean when we were talking about so when he uses the term selectivist that was sort of one potential red flags i know some people who use selectivists can have some questionable politics and then but the but the bigger red flag was definitely there's like uh when he's talking about the um music video I, I guess or whatever you want to yeah. call it there's sort of like a weird homophobic moment and so anyway so i was like all right let me like dig and figure out who this person is and i will say like the the one video that i went to first was he has a video about uh this i don't even know exactly what to call it maybe like a, I, he sort of frames as like an art exhibit but it's really i mean shia labeouf sets up this like camera uh, this is like after the 2016 election and basically just is chanting he will not divide us and is trying to like basically like has like other people will just like come in like it's streaming like 24 7 and people will just like come in and out and sort of uh, join in with the chant and uh, but then like different like trump supporters start coming in and trying to like sabotage it or you know Mm-hmm. make like racist jokes and stuff like that and you could just tell from the video he's way more sympathetic to the trump supporters than he is to uh 
the Trump protesters to the point of like showing different stuff that like out of context that will make the uh, Trump protesters look like they don't know what they're talking about or something or just like framing stuff as uh, the way that like Trump would frame like even the video sort of ends with like they have to put up a fence and he's kind of like oh kind of like Trump's wall or whatever as if like that proved that Trump was like right about building a wall or something however right. he's also from Australia so he's not he can't actually be like even if he's a Trump supporter in some abstract sense he can't really be a Trump voter it seems like so I, I don't know whether how easily we can read on these different cultural signifiers across uh, continents. But in any case, I sort of left off with just the sense that he's sort of this, you know, uh, white male troll figure who's, you know, thinks that if you get offended by something that you're a snowflake, doesn't understand why people would get offended by racism, homophobia, whatever, just because he's not those things. And basically where I landed on this was that I, because then what I did next was I started looking for walls or any like people who are more explicitly left wing who have looked at this and not really like at the time uh, there was like some people would talk about it, um, but since then there's not hasn't really been like a retrospective on it I don't think mm-hmm. and I think a lot of that is because like you know. A lot of parts of the internet are just dominated by that right-wing troll type of person. And Mm -hmm. I think something like even our podcast can be uh, feel like a a missing niche in that sense of like trying to take uh, reclaim certain parts of the internet, which I think, and it's the last thing I'll say, which I think is something that uh, Struggle Session, which is a podcast that we've talked about before that's something that they talk about a lot because they will say how a lot of their fans will sometimes you know want them to talk about quote-unquote politics more often whereas they will talk about a lot of cultural stuff movies books comic books stuff like that and their point is always like look everyone on the left is already just talking about politics like if you don't have someone out there who's talking about culture then the only right. people left who are going to be talking about culture are like West Wing liberals and Trump supporters. <laughs> so that's a hard no on both being a right wing troll and the West Wing liberal. Those are not what we're going for. Right, yeah. This will be our last podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the only other things I'll say. A d- on different, just different. Uh, yeah. Last thoughts. The as far as I can tell, Joseph Coney is still alive, which I only mentioned because in the Q and A video follow up he did, he said that uh, Joseph Coney was probably going to die soon because he, but he had something type two diabetes. He had type two diabetes. So he's saying that he was probably going to die soon. But as far as I can tell, he's not dead yet. And uh, also the George Clooney having a spy satellite was a bit distressing. Uh, we need to text yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> From all that tequila ad money, dude. It's legitimate, <laughs> it's legitimate labor. <laughs> but if we can't text the rich, we need at least some place that we can hide from the spy satellites. We need one. Should I say safe room or just let it cut to the audio? I mean, I just said it. All right, Alex, now that we're in the safe room, what do you have on your mind this week? So on my mind this week, maybe this is the only one that I know by name. I don't know a lot of other uh, Latin phrases of logical fallacies off the top of my head or any, or if I don't know who else does, but uh, ad hominem arguments are sort of something I see thrown around a lot, and I know that it's a logical fallacy, but maybe it should get a little more credit as, like, I don't know, something that, like, to take into consideration, and also I just think it's, alright, well, I'm coming from the point of, this is the safe room, we like dunking on people, and I love an ad hominem argument. I'm just gonna open with that. Let me just start over. I love ad hominem arguments. I get it. It's a fallacy, but, like, maybe there's some, like, validity behind it. Maybe, like, 
you think that taxes shouldn't exist and that we can pay for roads with social contracts, but also you think the age of consent should be like 13. So like, maybe I don't really care what you have to say about anything, you know, like I think you can start to fill, you just like, I think everybody every day sort of filters people out based on like other things I know about them. And like, I think that's okay. I get like you every, well, I was going to say every idea should be engaged equally. That's not true either at all. But tell me, maybe maybe I don't know what this means, Justin. Maybe this can be an education moment for me. Teach me, Justin. Or like anybody that's like, no, Fidel Castro was the worst. He was worse off for it. These are all the things of why communism is bad. And then like inevitably, like most of these people will have had stakes in like a fucking banana plantation or some shit, like pre like Cuba Cuban Revolution. And then they'll be like, well, of course you think that you little fucker. But like. Does that mean that their point can't be valid? Is that or is that an ad hominem argument, or is there are they like a legitimately compromised source of thinking that like uh, communist takeover they're bad because they had an investment in the capitalist structure? Uh, I mean, I think there's a difference between pointing out that someone has a conflict of interest or arguing that someone is being disingenuous in their argument for whatever reason. That's not. I. That's not totally an ad hominem because you're not really attacking their character in that way. But it's also not. Um, it doesn't necessarily disprove their argument either. But it could make an audience realize why they shouldn't necessarily trust them as like a, a credit. You're like attacking sort of their credibility rather than like their character. I, I would say sort of the difference there. I, I always say life is too short to be listening to idiots. And so from the perspective that I'm like, you shouldn't really be listening to stupid people in the first place. I, 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 I can go that far. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I could totally say that makes ad hominems good. I mean, I thought a good ad hominem is always funny. You know, I will. That's. I mean, that's really what I'm here for, uh, though. I, like, I, <laughs> I appreciate a full, it. like a, a full on like from like mid court dunk out of nowhere. That I'm gonna assume that person's right. Like, you just sort of like you got to give it to him a little bit, you know. Um, you know, I, I do think there's still value in you know engaging with certain arguments, but uh, I mean, maybe we could say, maybe we can compromise and say. You know, ad hominems are fine against some people. No, everyone. I I fully reject your compromise. No half measures, you goddamn centrist piece of shit. I'm not listening to you anymore. You have nothing good to say, all right? Fuck this guy, everybody. Now, Justin, I agree. Like, I understand that, like, technically, logically, socially, intellectually, morally... You're correct. But we really think about, like, the kids that we ran in, like, the circles we ran in, the people that we we both, like, know and have, like, engaged with and, like, shared stories about. And, like, just think about... <laughs> Send this one out. Just think about, like, trying to talk to you about, like, revolutionary politics. And, like, really, like, no, I think they're riots, not protests. Like, would you, like... Would you give him a second of your day? But again, I... I might just still draw a, a slight distinction between like a attack on someone's credibility and an attack on their character, but maybe it's splitting hairs too much. I I don't. I mean, I, I I appreciate I appreciate this as a take. I think this is a good take to sort of deposit into the, the discourse. Thank you. It's honestly the nicest thing you ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> so- <laughs> Fuck! You got me. God damn it. God damn it. <laughs> it's the meanest thing you've ever said to me. You built me up just to break me down. God damn you, Justin. <sighs> and yet, here's the thing. Now I know that you're correct about this argument. I, I've been proven wrong indefinitely about the ad hominem because of that exact moment. I concede everything I've ever said. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh my god. The rug has never been pulled out from underneath me so viciously. <laughs> <laughs> History will remember me as a coward and a fool.
Oh, fuck. All right, Justin, the floor will always be yours going forward, so please <laughs> tell me your much more important thing now. Oh, my God, I'm never going to recover. <laughs> so, my say from this week is that underrated and overrated are underappreciated as terms. You, It was right there. How dare you? But, okay, but I intentionally... Damn, I because it'll be too confusing if I, you know. <laughs> oh, it was very apparent that you didn't want to use the word, but I'm still disappointed. So, yeah, I think I personally often describe things as being either under or overrated. Uh, I don't know exactly when or why I started doing this, but I just find it to be the, like a nice, quick way to contextualize my feelings about whatever topic and yeah so it basically it's an acknowledgement that you know I, I know i know how other people feel about this thing but here's how i feel about it <laughs> you know so it could be like you know other people like this but i don't or you know i know this might make it seem like i have no taste but you know hear me out <laughs> but uh but i also think the words are even more nuanced than that because you know, I mean, obviously, if everything, you know, if you were the only person I was talking to or whatever, then, like, if I just said something was good or bad, then you could agree or not, and, you know, we would just go from there. But in reality, like, I know that people are talking to other people, you're absorbing mm -hmm. things through cultural osmosis. So I'm, I'm trying to give you, like, a warning, you know, to be like, you know, look, I'm not saying, like, if I say a movie's overrated, like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying mm -hmm. you need to lower your expectations. That's that's different. Mm -hmm. That's more nuanced. Or if I say something, that's true. If I say something's underrated. You know, I'm saying I'm aware that you have some reservations going into this because of the cultural context of this thing. But I'm saying, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be great. But I am saying, you know, you might want to try it. You might still enjoy it. You know, again, it's more nuanced. But, uh, but yeah, I think. Um, Basically, what I'm saying is, you know, if I'm going to say something, if I want to say something's good or bad, I'll just say it, you know. But if I'm choosing instead to say underrated or overrated it's because I'm trying to make, you know, convey some extra information, make a more nuanced point than that. But, you know, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, people are, don't seem always to be capable of hearing. They just hear good and bad on, you know, True. The, the, the nuance is sort of lost. So, um, you yeah, know, what, what do you think about that? I like it. I like that. Do you, I, my question, you might have said this and I might have missed it, but did you, do, when you say something is over underrated, do you usually qualify in what way it's over underrated or just sort of that you, we sort of all agree that like you're just sort of like the general consensus is that it is too high or is too low, even though something might still be of quality or not quality, regardless, it's, it's, it gets shit on too much, it gets praised too highly just generally, or do you like, it's overrated? because this or is underrated because this yeah yeah it depends i mean i honestly i feel like what happens a lot of times is i'll just be like i i, I can't even get to that point because as soon as they hear mm -hmm. that's when they jump up because they're like because because when you say something's overrated or whatever that means that the people you're talking to probably like it because that's why you're saying it's overrated and once they right. hear that it just like triggers in them and they're like like you can't even like get to why it's overrated or whatever they just like jump at you and like oh so you, you're saying this is bad it's like i didn't say it's mm -hmm. bad but and, you know, <laughs> and then maybe maybe i get a chance if i'm lucky to sort of explain what i'm trying to say yeah. But, but yeah but usually they, they jump up right away i agree i just my only fear is that somebody of a lower uh character merit than you would sort of just say no it's overrated and just sort of walk away like they've sort of won the contrarian argument this is sort of reach i'm getting some like sort of flashbacks to the contrarian argument just the sense of, like people will sort of throw out over or underrated as if they've sort of just won the internet for the day well i was gonna say this may be a slightly different point but you can misuse the terms you know with great power comes great responsibility Ooh. oh justin that's great we're filling this graveyard up here <laughs> i love it i'm happy to do that this is not a complaint <laughs> and you know because some people they use it 
you know, basically just as like a straw man, like they'll say something like right. ice cream is underrated or something like that. <laughs> ew, like, ew, 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 I hate that take. <laughs> oh my God. Where it's like, it's like no one, no one's actually underrating ice cream. Like everyone likes ice cream or whatever, but like, <laughs> you know, you, you just have to like, it's just, I, and maybe it is like the contrarian thing I, in like the bad way. I don't know. But, um, you know, or you whatever, like, or you, I, I couldn't think of a great example for overrated, but I just said, like, you know, maybe someone says, like, the original Spider-Man movies were overrated. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's like but no, like, people act, like people know that they're not perfect. They just like them better than, like, any of the other Spider-Man movies or something like that. So, right. you know, I mean, it's always going to be subjective, but, you know, you just got to be, you got to be responsible with it. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess, you know, I know you just sort of said you didn't have one necessarily in the chamber, but I got to ask, Justin, can I get in underrated and overrated and a perfectly rated just like one it's just one thing of each one thing that fits into each category it could, and they don't have to be related to each other just one thing that's like yep they like like they got it right it's not given enough credit it's given too much credit toronto as a city is overrated <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay that's so funny. I love over- I love saying cities overrated because I agree. That's so fucking funny. <laughs> Holy shit! Underrated. If I if I'm allowed to reach back into the bag here, please. The Purge movies underrated. <laughs> Motherfucker, I take it back. No. <laughs> oh, fuck, you got me. God damn it! I should not have conceded. <laughs> I'll check. Perfectly rated is tough because I, I like. I feel like a lot of things are pretty accurately rated. I'm not sure if there's one thing that like epitomizes. Yeah, like, perfectly rated, like just something that's perfectly rated that like people like the general consensus is that it's bad, or the general consensus is that it's like pretty good, like something that's like not like okay, and everybody's like, and it is actually okay. Something that's like really good, and everybody's like, yeah, this is really good, and they're right about it. Yeah, I mean, again, like, really bad. you know, maybe I, I might, you know, ice cream probably counts as something that's really good, that's properly rated. Um, yeah, but that's just like, yeah, fat tastes good. Like, that's not... <laughs> well, you know, but I'm mean, just saying, but... I, I get it, I get it. I am. Uh, but something that sucks that everyone... I mean, there's, like, a lot of, the, like... <laughs> Genocide. I <laughs> knew! <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, you'd be worried about cancer. Oh fuck! <laughs> well, what do you what do you got? Overrated black and white photography. Mm. Yeah, I can agree with that. Underrated collecting things as a hobby, but like specifically stamps. Unless I'm gonna find out like three weeks from now from one of your articles that this is like super problematic, <laughs> but like. I think people really like use like things like like bird watching like so, like these like like ho- like just having a hobby that like is like tame like people really like to shit on. There's like no reason to like they're just hanging out like it's just something to do. Like we're in fucking a dystopia of like an economic situation. Like just let people like do one thing that's like not hurting somebody else. You know, that's true. Okay. Uh, perfectly rated sundials. Hmm. I mean, how much experience do you have with sundials though? I have no experience with sundials. I have never heard... Oh, okay, I've never heard anybody have, like, a good or bad take on sundials, so maybe I'm, like, really just, like... I don't know the discourse. I don't know the discourse. Shit, you're right. <laughs> <I'm fucked up. sighs> no, I need, to, I need to have a perfectly rated take that you agree with, too. This, this podcast. Ooh! <laughs> yes. Zero with zero, like, fan base. It's a, it's a real... It's re- it gets as much attention as it deserves. I love it. <laughs> That's our show for this week. See the show notes for a link to view artifacts for yourself. Music for the podcast was produced by Nicholas Pizzuto. Rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Facebook, and tell a friend or enemy about the show. Join us again in three weeks as we find two new texts to discuss. How did you... I am vaguely familiar with Moment of Zen, and, like, I'm guessing... I, I don't know if you were just, like, saying that, like, this is, like, a sort of, an, like, the structure you want, or you want to do, like, a Moment of Zen type thing in your notes? No, I just mean, um... Like, where it'll be... <laughs> like, I, like, the trumpet is always... Uh, clearly, like, follows right. the outro. Like, you can uh-huh. tell, like, 
but the moment of Zen thing is just like the show is over, and then like it's very clear that this is like a random bit of whatever, like in this mm-hmm. case, recording that was a record, like like a blooper or something. I see. Just, like, I see. To the end. <laughs> just like <laughs> can't believe we let this get past the censors in the first season <laughs> or something upon ref- I mean we're very careful so I don't think we really have that much to like so- we've unlocked one uncensored piece of content and just we just fucking dock somebody 